Testament and to the book of Zechariah, the prophecy of Zechariah, the one before the last in the Old Testament, turning back from Matthew, it's much easier found, and we're reading some verses from chapter 14, Zechariah chapter 14, the last chapter, and verse 1, and then we're going over to Romans to lift the text out later on in the meeting. Verse 1. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. This is the great battle at Armageddon on the plains of Megiddo, in the valley of Jezreel, in northern Israel, it's yet to come. It's going to be the most awesome battle that this world has ever seen. The battlefield is 14 miles long, 14 miles wide, and 20 mi miles long. Verse 4, And his feet, his feet, shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove towards the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azrael. Ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Josiah, the king of Judah. Now I want you to watch this word. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. Turn over to Romans chapter 16, please. And keep your Bible open again at the last chapter. Romans 16. And let us bow in a moment's prayer. Father, I thank you for the word that you gave to me this morning, that now the hand of the Lord will be upon me in the evening, and you'll open my mouth. We thank thee for that word in Ezekiel, and we're claiming it tonight now, Lord that your hand will be upon us this evening and you'll open the mouth of this poor, wretched sinner saved by grace. O oh God, who is sufficient for these things? I am not and I need your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Fifty times in 300 verses in the New Testament, we are exhorted to be ready and to watch and to wait 
for the second advent, the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Twenty-one times the Lord himself in three and a half years warned and exhorted the people and us read these truths. Seven times a year. The only doctrine seven times a year of his three-year ministry. The only doctrine that surpasses and succeeds this doctrine is the doctrine of the gospel. Redemption, the atonement, justification, the blood and the cross. Fifty years ago, in this province, you'd have seldom attended an evangelical meeting or mission or conference, but the Lord's return would be mentioned. A lot of brethren in Baptist churches in particular every year had the weeks of meetings and conferences regarding the Lord's return. And in fact, if you would do a survey 50 years back and beyond, you will discover that a lot of young people, teenagers and children and young people, got saved through the preaching of these truths that we have been preaching here the last six Sunday evenings and the last six nights down in County Fermanagh. Why were they preaching it? They were preaching it because they believed it to be the Word of God and a very important doctrine. And the young people were seeking God and fear was coming on them. I have read many stories, indeed I've heard many testimonies of young men and women getting saved because they thought that there was one teenager come home from school one day and the first time ever that his mother and father weren't there. And he thought that the rapture had come. And uh, he got down on his knees and cried unto the Lord to save him. The fear of God was on people because they were being taught it in the church and they were being taught it at home. You see, it's not been taught now. And it's not been taught in homes now. The parents now generally leave the teaching of spiritual things to the Sunday school and to the children's meetings, and many in the children's meetings in Sunday school are not hearing it either. So you would need to take, take heed that you need to preach these truths to children and tell them about this. Now they tell us, oh, don't be scaring the children with these terrible truths that we're th preaching other in these nights. Don't be talking about plagues and tribulations and bogeymen and beasts and all this sort of thing. They don't want to hear that sort of thing, not at all. But they don't have any problem with them sitting at home, children, teenagers and others with iPads and internets and phones, watching demons and listening to all sorts of trumpery of wizards and all sorts of stuff that goes on now. They don't have any problem with that. Now, I want, I'm making points here as I finish this me, mission, meeting tonight, these prophecy meetings tonight, that I can leave an impression regarding the need to bring back this doctrine of the second coming of Christ. Did you ever hear people saying, oh, I love the wee story of Lydia? I love the story of Lydia because she was quietly and gently just to see him sitting at the riverside one Sunday after one Lord's Day afternoon. Uh, she was in the peace. There was no shouting and, and there was no fuss and there was no pressure and there was nobody bawling at her. She just came to the, to, just came to the Lord just with a nice wee word. You hear that? I see a brochure out there in the, in the thing there where there's a whole load of singing going on and a concert going on, and then it says at the bottom a wee word, wee word. Well, the, well, the Bible knows nothing about a wee word. Oh, it's just lovely, nice, wee, gentle speaking, and, and, and it'll not disturb anybody. Well, a few hours later, at midnight, after Lydia, God shook Philippi, and he shook the prison. And he shook the men and he shook the soldiers to get at the soul of one man. To get at the soul of one man. 
You see, God's after the soul of men and women and he can bring them any way he wants and he has different ways and different means of bringing them to God. He had to nearly starve to death the prodigal down at the swine talks before he came to himself and before he trotted home to the father's house. He had to put King, King, he had to put the king's son Manasseh, who murdered and was evil and wicked, he had to put him into a thorn bush and keep him there until he repented. See, God has different ways of, de- of dealing with people. And if you're a backslider tonight in this meeting and you're not going on with the Lord, you just think of Jonah because God put Jonah down into the Mediterranean, down into the belly of the fish for him to cry out. And to get you back to the Lord, the Lord might have to throw a storm across your path. He might have to bring you down into the depth of despair until you really get squeezed that much that you will cry. You're getting it too easy, you see, at the minute. But God has ways of afflicting people. He has ways of dealing with people that we don't know. They're beyond what we know. I'm making the point to you again that this doctrine of the second coming of the Lord is a doctrine that's not preached and should be preached. And the reason for it is that the devil hates it. The devil really hates it. He's attacking it unprecedentedly with venom and with fury because of the damage to the kingdom. And we're so divided regarding the doctrine of this in the churches that the people have ceased to preach it all together. Before I go down to hit the point of my message tonight, I want to say the devil hates it. Number one reason that he hates it, because it has to do with the resurrection. The devil hates the resurrection. And no matter what view we take on eschatology tonight or any other night, whether whether we're pre-millennial, amillennial, dispensationalists or Presbyterians or Methodists, it doesn't matter. The devil doesn't care. He doesn't care what you believe or who you are if he can keep you in death. Death. That's all the devil wants to do. He wants to keep you in death. He wants to keep you in bondage. He wants to keep you in pain and suffering. He doesn't want you to get life. He doesn't want you to get power. The doctrine of the resurrection of dead saints and dead sinners for eternity is at the heart of the preaching of this second common. And the devil so hates it. Remember that the Lord Jesus Christ raised three people from the dead during his earthly ministry. And every three of them were reposed greatly. Jairus' daughter, she died in bed. A lot of people die in bed. A lot of people need to get out of their bed and start praying and praising God in the morning. There's a lot of people die in bed and this... Jairus' 12-year-old daughter died in bed, and when the Lord Jesus says she was only asleep, they laughed him to scorn. And that's a very strong word. She died in bed. In Luke Gospel chapter 7, the, the son of the widow of the city of Nain, he's out of bed. He's at another stage. He's in the coffin. That's the procedure. You're out of bed and into the coffin. You could be out of bed and into the coffin before tomorrow morning and into the grave before Wednesday. Me, some of you may be. Well, this fellow here, he was he 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 was out of bed. He was dead and he was in the coffin and he was away. He was on his way to be buried. But in the very same chapter. In that chapter of Luke 7, we read that John the Baptist wobbled. It's in that very chapter following that that we read that John the Baptist in prison, shut up by the devil, shut up in prison, ready to be beheaded, cried out and called and sent his disciples to the master and asked asked Jesus, are you the Messiah or do we look for another? He wobbled in his faith. And let me tell you, when the devil can get you down into the tight corner and he gets you into prison and he gets you hemmed in, he's dirty. He's dirty. 
And once he gets you bound in drugs, and once he gets you bound in drink, and once he gets you in the corner, he's a dirty fighter, and he'll give you the last blow. You can't handle him. Don't you be trying to handle the devil and the demons and the powers of darkness that are about in these days. You'll not be able to handle it. John the, John the Baptist was, Jesus said there was none born greater than woman. He saw hundreds saved and baptized with the power of God. But he wobbled. He doubted. And we all doubt and we all wobble. When you come then to the third one, Lazarus, Lazarus, he, he was in the grave. One in the bed, one in the coffin, one in the grave. And you read about Lazarus in John Gospel, chapter 7. And Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And as soon as he come forth, here's what we read. Then from that day forth, they took counsel to put him to death. So I suggest to you that every time that this resurrection is practiced or every time resurrection is preached, and when, when the devil hears about the resurrection of dead sinners unto Christ and resurrection of dead saints into the glory, he hates it. He hates it. And if Jesus Christ would hung on the cross, crowned with thorns and stripped naked, and when he cried, it is finished, it didn't worry the devil too much. And if he'd have stayed there and they took him down on the cross and they put him into the tomb and they put the stone and they put the seal and they put the soldiers and all the sin of the world on him, if everything would have stayed in there, he'd have rubbed his hands and he'd have won the day. But he rose again. We have a living Savior tonight. He's alive. He's alive. Praise his name. He's alive. The devil would have rubbed his hand. He would have been back in business again. But he re rising, he justifies us. And the devil hates it. Let me tell you tonight, he hates death. He hates life. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, when Paul was preaching at Athens, he said that some mocked and others said, we'll hear him again. They mocked him. You know there are three lives. He says, Jesus says, I have come that you might have life. Thank God for eternal life. Thank God that you can have eternal life tonight. You can pass from death onto life sitting in the seat. That happened to me 53 years, two years or three years ago, down in Vermont. One morning, 11 o'clock, just suddenly, powerfully, I passed from death onto life. Hallelujah. I'm living in the good of it ever since. Jesus says, I have come that you might have life. And the devil doesn't like sinners being plucked from the brands brand from the burning. He doesn't like them being set free. And whenever the Lord moves, he can do nothing about it. And he'll save you tonight if you let him. He'll restore you tonight if you let him. He has come that you might have life. He hasn't come to give you death. He hasn't come to give you, give you pain and sorrow that the way you have it today because of sin. Sin has you the way you are. He has come to give us life. But then he says, I've come to give you life. But I've come to give you life, abundant life. Hallelujah, that's another life. You see, there's a lot of God's people and they're saved, but that's all they have. But they have no joy, they have no praise, they have no power, they have no abundant life. He's come to give abundant life. I have abundant life tonight. I'm full of life tonight in my soul because of what he has done for me. And the Holy Spirit will fill a man and fill a man and send a man and we'll enjoy every moment, every day of our life. No matter what about the trials or the troubles. No matter about the, what about the sickness. No matter about what's going on in the family. Joy, joy in my heart tonight. Hallelujah. You see, he's come to give life. He's come to give abundant life. Have you abundant life? Are you enjoying the Lord? Are you enjoying the singing? Are you enjoying the meetings? Are you enjoying the prayer meetings? Are you waiting to get up in the morning to see what the Lord's going to say to you? Are you an old, dead, dry, carnal Christian with no power, no life, no authority? Oh, God help you. He didn't die for that, let me tell you. He has come to give us life. He has come to give us abundant life. And he has come to give us eternal life. Hallelujah. Life forever with him. We'll see that as we come to a close. Forever with the Lord. Hallelujah. Eternal life. Life. Eternal life. Jesus alone is the giver. The devil hates life. Oh boy, he, when he sees a movement of zeal, when he sees a movement of prayer, when he sees a movement of souls, when he sees people getting excited, he hates it and he'll drive every, every nail into you to stop you doing it. 
And that's why the doctrine of the second coming is so opposed and so hated and so mocked and so scoffed at because it's resurrection. It's power of God. Power of God. Now, I want you to watch the text here in Romans 16 as we come to your close because we're going to tie up Zechariah 14 with this 20th, 20th verse of Romans 16. Now, watch this 20th verse. And the God of peace. Let me stop there a wee moment. God is a God of peace. Peace. My peace I give unto you, Jesus said, not as the world giveth. My friend, the world can't give you something that it hasn't got. The world is like a troubled sea casting up mire and dirt. The world can't give you peace. Drink will not give you peace. Drugs will not give you peace. But God can give you peace. Justified through faith, we have peace with God. Boy, I'm at peace tonight in my soul. And I have been for 53 years. But I wasn't before that. Wrecking and tearing and fighting and smashing cars. Not at all. Couldn't sleep at night, drinking and cashing. No, no. But oh, <laughs> the, the peace of God. That's what the word says here. I'm the God of peace. Shall bruise Satan under your feet. Now, we read about his feet in Zechariah. This is not his feet now he's talking about. It's your feet. It's the saints' feet. Hallelujah. Your feet. I am shortly. The word is there, quickly and shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now, I want to set this in the context, this verse. Because the context is uh, the Apostle Paul is closing, closing this letter to the church at Rome, speaking about unity. Look at verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them. That's a powerful word. Watch. Watch. Give a wide berth to actually the Greek is. Mark them which cause division and offense contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, deceive the heart of the simple. Now hear me tonight. The Lord is closing this letter to the Romans, and he's speaking about unity amongst the people of God. And I'm not going down that lane tonight for there to be far too much to say. But he's saying about these people here, and if you study this chapter 16, you'll find that there's at least seven women, and this is Mother's Day. There's at least seven women referring to, he's referring to here, that stood with him. And I don't care what you say, but I tell you tonight, women are not as divisive as men. And many's a woman has saved us from divisions. And he's speaking about uh, women, he's speaking about unity here. He says, you watch those. The actual word is, give them a wide breath, swerve away from those who cause division and rebel against the doctrines that you have learned. And boy, there's a word here for all of us tonight. Because he says they're not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. They're serving the devil. These are the boys here now that we're contending with time and time again. Here's the boys that I have contended with in the preaching of this doctrine of the second coming of the Lord. These are the boys that sit on the swivel chairs with their belly over their belts and they're giving out and pontificating of what way to run things and what way to do things. They're scoffers in the last days. 
That's what he's saying. And he says, you turn away as fast as you can from them. They're deceiving the hearts of the simple. That's the innocent and the harmless and the young convert. And I'll tell you, the devil's hammering at the young converts. And he's hammering at these truths that we're, that we're preaching. There's no doubt, no doubt about that. And these boys know nothing about prayer. They know nothing about waiting on God. They know nothing about crying unto God. They know nothing, they, they know nothing of vision or burden. They know nothing what the battle is to like to be in it. All they can do is give guff. So that's in the context. But this verse, Romans 16, Romans 16 and 20, refers not to the rapture. Now, this is the point I want to make as a close in this last sight. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. He's not talking here about the rapture. He's talking here about the revelation. When he, he's not talking when he comes to the air. And, and I can't go over this again tonight, but any moment now he's going to burst the clouds and he's going to come to the air and he's going to take, he's going to take his people out. And be an awful thing, my friend, if you're a saved woman or a saved man and your wife is with you or your husband is with you and your children's with you and, and, and just like that you're gone and, and, and you're left, they're gone and you're left. That's the teaching of the Word of God. Don't you scoff at it. This is the snatching away, the harpazo, which the rapture is. Quickly, taken out just in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us which are alive and remain, we shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord, just like a thief in the night. Quickly, he said, I come quickly. Surely I come quickly. That's what he said. And you'll be left damned forever. Yes, you will. You'll go into the tribulation period and you'll take the mark of the beast on your forehead or on your right arm. And you'll go into all the plagues of Revelation. And you read them and through the plague, the awful, awful plagues of, of, of Revelation. And all hell will break loose when you'll not be able to buy or sell without the beast. And, and my friend, the suffering in the tribulation is awful. Awful. And after that, you're in hell. And after that, you're in the lake of fire. And all you have to do tonight is to cry out and say, Lord, save me. Lord, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to the lake of fire. I don't want the mark of the beast on me. I want to go where my mother is. I want to go where my father is. They're dead and Christ shall rise first and we'll all be lifted together. I tell you, what a mighty truth. Any wonder... Is it any wonder that the devil is there any wonder that the devil hates us? This is the revelation when he comes with the saints to reign. When he come, we read that in Zechariah. Let me do this for you. First Corinthians chapter 15, he comes to raise us. Listen to what Paul says. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. When he raises us from the dead, when he comes in that moment, in that twinkling of an eye, and the graves of all the saints of God lift up, my friend, he's not going to leave us. He's not taking us out of the grave to put us back into this old sin-stained, tear-stained, blood-stained world. No, no, because here what happened, you know, he comes in 1 Corinthians 15 to raise us, 1 Thessalonians 4, then he comes to meet us. Where is it? First Thessalonians 4 says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the dead shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Hallelujah. He's not going to leave us. He's going to meet us. He's coming to meet me. He's coming to raise me. And then he's coming to meet me. He's not going to raise me and leave me. Glory to his name, he wouldn't do that. He met, he, he, I, I met him 30, 50 years ago. He had never left me an hour. Never left me an hour. So he's coming for us and he's coming to meet us. But when he comes to Colossians 3 and verse 2, it says, When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall we appear with him. 
When he comes back, we read that. When the saints come back, we shall come back with him. If we're going to come back with him, he had to come for us. He's the millennial boys. Such a doctor in this doctor of amillennialism. Dead as dodos. No wonder they're not praying. No wonder they're not seeking God. No wonder they're not excited about the Lord's return. Not a bit wonder. I'm not going to start on them tonight. But oh, let me tell you, he's going to, he's going to, he, you know what, do you know what? I'm wanted, do you know there's a big poster in heaven with my name on it? Do you know what it says, wanted, dead or alive? He's going to take me dead or alive. If I'm dead, I'm going to come up. If I'm still alive, I'm still going to come up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's going to raise me, he's going to meet me, and he's going to come with me. What more could you want than that? Hallelujah. And when we come back with him, where we have been reading tonight, when we come back with him to the Mount of Olives to reign, that's a great millennial reign of a thousand years, the golden age. He's going to, Jesus, that the king is coming. The king has come here. This is the golden age when he'll destroy them with the brightness of his coming, north, south, east, and west, all the, he, all the powers of darkness from the world, every enemy of hell, China, India, every last one of them. And you know, it's not hard to see that today. You know, a couple of years ago, you would wonder about this, but I'll tell you, Jerusalem, Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, lift up your head and look up. They're maybe not surrounded with armies tonight, but I'll tell you, verbally they are. And you can see tonight very handy how every, every nation of the world is against her tonight. Even in Belfast, even in Dublin, from the river to the sea, they're chanting and they're singing. They're all against her. They hate her tonight. Well, they hated him without a cause. And they'll hate you if you stand for the Lord. I tell you, he's going to put every last one of them down and their banners and their flags and all the rest. He's going to put them all down. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun. He's the eternal God. He's the God of Israel. He's the God of Abraham. He's the God of Jacob. He's the mighty God. He's the God of his people. Pray for Israel. Pray for Netanyahu. Pray for the Knesset. Pray for the fighting men and women. Pray for them against the Hamas and the Hezbollah and all the rest of them and all those Arabs who want to destroy them. That's what they're going to do. They're going to surround Israel. And when they've all surrounded him in China with their millions, he'll come in the brightness of his coming to the Mount of Olives, and his feet shall stand, the blessed feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Hallelujah. And I'll be with him. That's what it says. I'm simple enough to believe it. Because I'm coming with him. And I know I'm coming with him because the word tells me I'm coming with him. <laughs> oh, I tell you. And I tell you, my friend, the first thing that will happen is one angel with one chain and one moment will take the old devil, the dirty old devil, and bind him and the false prophet and the beast and cast him in to the bottomless pit. I tell you what a day that will be. You ever hear the, the, the coal man's mission? 50, 700 years ago, the coal men in Belfast had a mission, had, 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 had meetings. And they bought an old hearse. And they took this all out of the old hearse and they used to go around Belfast. You used to hear Willie Mull talking about them. They used to go around Belfast doing these meetings in the hearse. Boys are go, bo these male boys squared out. They're coming in Mercedes and big Volvos and all sorts of... But these boys came in a hearse to sing. And they used to sing all the way in the hearse and they used to pray all the way in the hearse. And they said that to hear them men praying would have done your heart good. People would have went to prayer meeting just to hear them praying. They were just old, rough, cold men from the docks. And someone was preaching on this one one night and the boy shouted up, Lord, give me a kick at him, I'm going into hell. And boy, I'll tell you, I'll be glad to see the end of them. Uh, you see, we're reading here, we're reading here that he's going to be under our feet. He's not under my feet at the minute, or he's not under the saints' feet at the minute. No, he's round my feet. And I'll tell you, he'll trip me. 
if he can tomorrow. And he'll stumble me and he'll kick me too. And many a kicking he has given me. <laughs> but the boy was right. I get a kick at him going into hell. It'll be great. It'll be powerful. He's not under my feet. But I'll tell you, since Calvary, he's under his feet. Amen. <laughs> Amen. He's under his feet. Genesis chapter 3 and 15 is the fulfillment of this verse. I haven't time to go into it tonight. Satan shall bruise his heel, but he shall bruise his head. Since the mighty victory of Calvary, and I'll be finished early tonight, since the mighty victory of Calvary, Satan's under his feet. Oh, I tell you, he ascended up into the glory. He's at the right hand of the Father, a Prince and a Savior, coming again someday, as we say in the clouds of glory. And Satan's under his feet. He's the Prince of the power of the air. He's under his feet in all his demons. And he can do what he likes with them any time he wants. But when he comes to the air to take the church out and to take the believers out, when he comes to the air, he, Satan goes run. He always runs before him. He runs. He comes to the earth in the person of the Antichrist. He's the in, Antichrist is the devil incarnate, but he's still under his feet. And when he comes to the earth, to the Mount of Olives, one angel, one chain, one moment, will bind him into the bottomless pit and he's still under his feet and he always will be. But when we come with him, we come with him, he says we'll put him under our feet. Glory to God. The battle's over, friend. The battle's gone. No more sickness. No more sin. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more broken hearts, no more cancer, no more coronaries, no more Alzheimer's. I tell you, in that great millennial reign of Christ, the lion shall lie down with the lamb. And the wee child will put her hand into the wasp, the ass nest, and not be stung. There'll be nothing to sting. A very dog will not bark. There's a dog up there and someone drives up, he barks. Why would he do that? He's watching. He's guarding. I tell you, the very dog will not bark. The dog will have no need to bark. It'll be just as it was before sin entered and before Satan got his hand on Adam and Eve. It'll be very same. I tell you, it's coming. And that mighty day is coming. And here in the words of Revelation, Revelation 1 and 5, Here's what we'll be doing. We'll sing unto him who loved us and loosed us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And we'll sing the redemption song throughout the ages of eternity. For he has made us to be kings and priests unto God, the Father, to him be the glory and the praise and the dominion forever and forever. Let me close with this. The king has come here. He has come. King of the Jews. King of Israel. King of the nations. King of glory. King of kings. And Lord of lords. He has come. The battle's over. The strife is over. Victory is over. Keep praying, keep praising, keep battling, keep fighting against the devil. Fight the good fight. It's the only fight that's worth fighting. Not worth fighting for the protocol. Fight the good fight of faith. Stand firm in these last days, my friend, and cry unto God and pray for your loved one. Listen, if you're not saved in this meeting tonight, don't leave the precincts of this hall until you seek the Lord and cry to him and repent of your sins and say, Lord, save me. And my friend, if you could see what's before you, you would, wouldn't wait till the meeting's over. You wouldn't wait. Come unto me, all ye that labor. Are you laboring tonight? Are you under a burden tonight? Do you not know where to turn tonight? 
Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The God of peace, peace that passes all understanding, can fill your heart and your soul tonight. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He's not always going to be found and he's not always going to be near, but he's near tonight. We're still in the day of grace. Come for all things are now ready. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart because you go out of this meeting tonight and you're still not saved. You're getting a bit harder now. And that hardening will go on until you're hardened, until your conscience is seared like a hot iron and you'll not get saved and you'll not want to be saved. Boy, if the Holy Spirit is tenderly dealing with you tonight, you heed him. There's a wee room at the back on the way out there. I have some books with me, but don't take the books to go home and read them. Get saved before you leave here and seek the Lord. And if you seek him with all your heart, you shall surely find them in 50, 40 years preaching and never saw a man or woman that sought the Lord with all their heart that didn't find him. Never did. Now you come repenting tonight. If you come doing, needing business tonight, are you tired of your sin? Are you tired of the world? Are you tired of all that's going on around you? And you want life, life, abundant life. Come to him tonight. And he'll give you the peace and he'll give you the joy. Because he could come before even we leave this place just now. May God help you to flee to the old rugged cross. My friend, just take a wee minute as we close. Ah, just think, the one that created all things, the almighty Son of God, the everlasting Father, the Ancient of Days, who was contrary who contracted to a span and comprehensively made man was stripped naked and nailed to that old cross for our sins. And from that old cross, he says to you tonight, I died for you. I died for your sins. I was wounded for your transgressions and bruised for your iniquities. And if you come now, I'll save you when there's time. Will you do that tonight? May God help you backslider to be restored and sinner to be saved and saints to be ready for that great day when he shall come for us and he'll come and meet us and when he'll come with us. Amen. Father, we just thank you tonight, O oh God, for your precious word. Our hearts are filled tonight to think that you died for a wretch such as me. Oh, God, we want to give you praise and thanks tonight, Lord. The people of God should be all praising tonight. We should be all thanking God tonight that you ever saved wretches such as we. Nothing to do with us, Lord, but, oh, God, we cursed you, we blasphemed you. We done everything we could to hurt the people of God, but one day in your mercy and grace. Oh, what love, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we might be called the sons and the children of God. Can't understand it, Lord. It baffles me every day to think that you saved a wretch like me. And I just want to praise you tonight from this pulpit. I want to thank you tonight, Lord. Oh, God, our Father, if I never get up that lane to get home, I pray you shall be in your presence. And forever I shall be with the Lord. Glory to your name. And I don't deserve it, Lord. We don't deserve it, Lord. We deserve wrath and judgment in hell. But the cross stood in our way and Jesus pleaded with us to come. And oh, we came. Thank God we did. And so, Lord, tonight do we pray that you'll, Lord, give, give grace tonight. Give help tonight, Lord. And Lord, save souls in this meeting. And the many that will listen to it, Lord, we pray that many will turn up to in heaven. In, result, in the result of these six meetings of prophecy, we ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen. 199. And then our meeting's over. I want to hear you singing this song. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. Hallelujah. Praise his name. He is on the throne tonight. No matter what's happening.
I was going to, I was going to get you to sing verse four again, but you moved that hard, I couldn't get in. But because of that, I'm going to make you sing the last two verses again, verses four and verse five. Okay, amen. to the Lord. May God bless you. Amen.